Well, thank you very much. Yeah, it's really, really great to be here. Um, so as a philosopher, I spend a lot of time thinking about sort of the nature of human cognition. And I think um, my view is that, you know, we've enhanced ourselves in many different ways for a long period of time. So uh, humans enhance themselves in all sorts of different ways with different technologies that we use. And just one example of that is going to be these brain-computer interfaces, which is, which is what I'll talk about. So um, another example is just a very simple technology, like a, like a pen and pencil. So we've, we've actually done quite a lot with, with just that very simple tool. We've enhanced our memories. We've created new kinds of symbols, which carry content that we can't carry in our heads and can't make sense of. And then we can offload those symbols and push them around in the world like expert mathematicians do to allow us to have sort of higher order thoughts that we couldn't imagine having within our heads. Uh, and so this is a view that a lot of philosophers talk about. And in fact, um, probably foremost is, is the philosopher I've quoted here, Andy Clark. So Clark thinks that enhancing ourselves is something that's really nothing new. So that um, humans have been doing this for a long time. And actually, Clark calls us the offloading ape. So he thinks this is what's, what's really unique about humans, is that we're able to offload our kind of cognitive dirty work into the environment. So I think this is right. And, um, what I want to suggest, though, is that this kind of new technology of, of brain-computer interfaces might be a bit different. So that, that, in other words, not all technological enhancement is alike. Um, and that this new technology might raise some, some interesting and somewhat thorny ethical questions. So just as a bit of history, um, it was predicted about in the 1960s that uh, brain-computer interfaces and different kinds of neuro-enhancement might take place, even things like nootropics. So this is a, a comic from 65, which says, by 2016, man's intelligence and intellect will be able to be increased by drugs and by linking human brains directly to computers. And in fact, that's pretty spot on, because it's 2018 now, and there's been all sorts of different ways in which uh, companies and actors are trying to basically build a shared boundary between brains and computers that will allow for the direct flow of information or information exchange, so bypassing the skull. I just want to give you a sense of some of the major actors here. Um, I won't go through them all. But you might really wonder, so these people are throwing hundreds of millions of dollars, just for the record, at, at this building this technology. And you might wonder, first of all, why are we doing this, right? Kind of seems like a shady idea to begin with. So just to give you a sense, I think there's sort of three overarching goals here. One is rehabilitative, so to assist people who have some kind of neurodegenerative condition, maybe locked-in syndrome or uh, paralysis of some kind. Uh, a second goal, I think, is assessment, so to be able to detect somebody's level of consciousness or even to detect their intentions. And I mean that sort of in the philosophical sense of intentionality, so beliefs, attitudes, desires. Uh, and then the third, which is probably what, what we're most interested in, in a sense, is, is the enhancement possibility. So a whole bunch of our cognitive attributes are being targeted for enhancement. And I'll go through a, a laundry list of them later on. But memory is being targeted, information processing, attention, focus. Uh, all, I'm going to argue almost every cognitive attribute you can think of is being targeted. Um, and so just to give you a sense as well, the way in which this is being done, so there's about sort of three functional different kinds of brain-computer interfaces. The first kind is one that can detect um, and interpret your brain signals and then translate those into some kind of action in the world. So we'll call those sort of sending devices or unidirectional output devices. And then a second kind is a unidirectional input. So it's one that allows for the um, external influence of your brain signals. And then a third kind is one that allows for both sending and receiving, so a bidirectional communication. And that's kind of the gold standard here. It's what people are really after. So um, as you might imagine, like you can probably think of quite a few ethical concerns that, that these technologies might raise. And I'll sort of go through a few of them today. I don't have a lot of time. But I think I'll start with the most obvious, which is just medical safety concerns. So how is this actually being done, right? So there's two sort of techniques at play here, invasive and non-invasive technologies. 
So non-invasive technologies include things like transcranial magnetic stimulation, fMRI, EEG. These sorts of devices are, for the most part, medically approved. Um, and in fact, some of them are approved on the consumer market as well. So you can actually buy a self-use EEG headset. Uh, it can allow you to fly a drone. This is pretty affordable, too. It's available on the consumer market. So they're deemed as pretty safe. Um, so you know, one of the downsides of these type of technologies, I should mention, so EEG tends to be the most popular in part because it's seen as the safest, but also it's the most portable currently, and it's the least expensive. Um, so one of the downsides here is that there's a lower signal to noise ratio. So you're picking up on a lot of different activity that's going on and not just what the target activity, so the brain activity. And then um, sort of one of the other downsides is that it's hard to get high bandwidth bi-directional communication with these type of non-invasive techniques. So for those reasons, people are moving towards more invasive techniques. And these are ones that require cracking through you know, the scalp and the skull. So they're quite sort of risky, medically speaking, especially if you're sort of opting for it for enhancement purposes. Um, but a lot of work has been done here. So electrocorticography is very popular. This is a, a technology that allows, allows us to record uh, brain signals from the surface of the cortex, um, which is used frequently for medical purposes. Uh, the downside here is that there's still some uh, signal-to-noise um, interruptions. So in other words, there's a lot of activity in the brain, and not all of it is happening at the surface of the brain. So we want to go deeper, get to the activity at the source. And that's what these other technologies allow for. So things like deep brain stimulation uses implanted electrodes, uh, but you also have implanted chips, and even more far out ideas I've included here. So like everyone's heard of Elon Musk's idea of some sort of neural lace, which is, I guess the idea is some sort of chemical adhesive injection, um, not yet tested on humans. <laughs> Deep brain stimulation is tested on humans. It's often used to prevent seizure, seizures in uh, folks, who, so epileptic patients. So the deeper into the brain you get, I think, the more risky the technology is. And we really don't have a good sense, medically speaking, about what kind of consequences these are going to have for the health of our brain uh, and also for cognitive impairment. So, one, one concern for any kind of invasive technique is the fact that you'll have to be in some kind of hospitalization. There's the risk of infections. But you might have seen the headlines here. It's just kind of an extreme example of MIT. So MIT was severed its ties to this startup company called Nectome, which was trying to advance some kind of mind uploading technology, which is one of the ambitions of, of brain computer interface engineers, um, that was deemed to be 100% fatal. <laughs> So highly risky, I would say. <laughs> um, now, not all of them are so risky. So I think, uh, again, some of the medically approved ones, there seems to be a, low, a lower risk. Um, but it doesn't have all the, the sort of target aims that we, can, that we want to achieve with this technology. So I think in general, um, one of the first, or one of the, sort of the next ethical concern I'll look at is how um, doctors are going to get informed consent um, from patients who they want to test these technologies on. So the target population here tends to be people who it's hard to get informed consent from. So um, if you're dealing with somebody who you know, has paralysis or, or is non-communicative, there's somebody who could potentially benefit quite a bit from this technology. But on the other hand, um, there's a high chance in which it's, it's, you know, it's hard to really inform them and be sure that they understand the risks versus the benefits of the technology. And then another big concern here um, is that they're, you know, they're in a position where they want some chance or hope of being able to communicate to their loved ones. So it's hard to balance that with potential risks, some of which is exploratory and unknown. And a further concern here is the media hype, I think, around these technologies. So this tends to lead to some kind of misinformation and unreasonable expectations about what these technologies can achieve. So I think a lot needs to be done about actually informing people before these are opted for. But um, another context in which this is highly concerning is one in which the people it's being used on might not have a choice to opt in. So if we consider the military context, there's a, there's a lot of interest from the military in these types of technologies, as you might imagine. So DARPA, in particular, has thrown hundreds of millions of dollars at them. 
and they have a, a set of programs which are developing these for different reasons. It's a kind of dream of creating a super soldier, so one who has increased empathy for their own group and decreased empathy for the, for the enemy, and a super soldier who has you know, uh, enhanced intention skills, enhanced uh, reflexes, enhanced information processing skills, even the capacity to communicate silently to other soldiers on the battlefield. So if you have sort of two implanted devices, or being able to receive information from a machine directly. So these are all actual goals of the military right now that are being developed. Um, so for those of you who don't know, the sort of military ethos is to be all that you can be. And so given this commitment that soldiers have to this, there's a kind of concern that they might not have an, a choice to either opt in or opt out of this, but in fact they'll have a sort of duty to enhance themselves. Um, related concerns here are what we will do with discharged military who have these devices implanted. So will we force them to remove these devices, um, in which case um, they would have to undergo some sort of invasive surgery. They may suffer things like a lost sense of self, maybe even some kind of post-enhancement depression, you can imagine. Um, but also, alternatively, if we allow them to enter society with these devices, um, what are the social costs of that exactly, right? So now we're competing for jobs against these super soldiers, and we're competing for mates, and we're competing for all sorts of things. It's not clear how they're going to be accepted either. Um, so what are the sort of social costs or social stigma that these people would have? So I think these are actually very immediate concerns since it's most likely that um, security uses are going to be um, sort of established and put into action before the sort of consumer market for these technologies reach the consumer market, which is something that an earlier speaker brought up. So a lot of these technologies get developed, first of all, for security purposes. Uh, a concern, I think, for anyone using these is going to be privacy. So our, our constitutions tend to protect things like mental privacy. So a user is going to have to be aware of what type of information can get accessed, where that information is being stored, and who, who can access it. So if that information is being stored somewhere and it's being communicated wirelessly, okay, we know that any information that's communicated wirelessly is susceptible to hacking. So there's a concern that's called brain hacking, <laughs> which is literally the concern that your beliefs, your desires, your attitudes, your intentions, so think about your feelings towards others, your level of truthfulness, you know, what you really think about person X or person Y, that could be reached by sort of a, a third party, a malicious actor, and used to exploit you in some way. So unless there's the, the, the right kind of security guards on this, I think there's a, a good, good reason to be concerned. Um, very related to this is what's called brain jacking. So brain jacking refers to not just your information being used or, or accessed, but actually having a device which allows for a malicious actor to externally influence you in a non-consented way. So imagine that uh, a soldier, for example, is given misinformation and then acts on that misinformation. Okay? In the philosophical sense, autonomy means something like having the right to self-determine. And so it's not clear whether or not somebody who's being influenced externally is really acting in an autonomous way, in sort of the meaningful sense for a philosopher. And in that case, it's not clear who we're going to be holding responsible. So autonomy and responsibility are really intimately connected for philosophers. So again, imagine that misinformation is provided or a third party is, is giving you uh, the wrong information or even just controlling you remotely. Okay, who are we holding responsible for this? Is it the device? Is it the individual? Is it the third party that we can't trace? So it, there's sort of thick ethical problems here, I think. Thick in the sense that they're really meddling with what, what we mean by these concepts and stretching them in ways that we're not used to. So this is, again, part of why I think this technology is different than, than some of the technologies we're used to. Um, this is just a case of what I call the, the rat mobile. So it's um, a case in which uh, the rat was um, being able to, with invasive technology, being able to control the machine they're driving. So their feet aren't, aren't actually on the ground, but it's being moved around. And this is being done, so we have thought-controlled wheelchairs, for example. So it's not that far off. Now, I'll sort of end here with a big picture concern about what this means for humanity, which is, in a, in a sense, what I work on. <laughs> um, 
So there's a question about what this is going to do to us as humans, right? How are we shaping our trajectory? How are we shaping our nature as humans? Um, are we making ourselves less human, in a sense, by tinkering with Mother Nature's path for us? Are we literally turning ourselves into some kind of cyborgs? And is that OK? Is that fine? You know, so these are questions that aren't really being answered on the individual level, so no individual is going to choose this. But it's more of a group think question, so we have to decide as a community what sort of progress we want. And again, I just want to say, just to give you a sense of, of what sort of cognitive attributes are being targeted here, so here's just a short list. Memory, information processing, navigation, decision making, salience, perception, action, communication, emotion, reasoning, and actually there's you know, twice as many than I can fit on there. But, but my sort of hypothesis here is that with each of these steps that we take, we kind of step further and further away from the minds that we recognize as human minds, um, which is, again, not necessarily a bad thing, but something at least we ought to be thinking about, right? I'll end there. <laughs> so just to list my sources. Thank you.